Good evening, everybody. If we could stand in the presence of the Lord tonight. We are grateful that everybody's here tonight, whether you're in the building or joining us online. There is a sweet, sweet presence of the Lord in this place. I, I felt him as soon as I walked in here tonight. Brother Larry and I were talking. Uh, it's easy in your morning prayer and prayer throughout the day. Sometimes it may just feel like you're going through the motions, Brother David. But as soon as you get into that prayer room, it's instant. I feel the Holy Ghost sweep over me. And there's just a sweet, sweet presence in this place as I was watching everybody smile and, and, and talk before service. I, I believe the Lord's getting ready to move in this place tonight. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to go into prayer tonight. Do I got anybody on my right side? Brother Terrence? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Brother Kevin? Yes. Sister Crystal? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Anybody else on Sister Rita? Yes, ma'am. Brother Cody? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else on this side? Middle? Sister Eloise? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Brother Derek? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sister Judy. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Angel. We got you, buddy. Yes, sir. Okay. We can do that. Amen. I'm glad when the children raise their hand. Amen. Amen. They're getting involved. Anybody else in the middle that I miss? Sister. We got you. We got you. On my left side, Brother David. Yes, sir. Sister Maria. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. We can do that. We can do that. Sister Nadine. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. We can do that. Right behind you. Right here. Okay. We got you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, let's remember Sister Jane. Let's remember her. In the back. Yes, ma'am. We can do that. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. Nothing. Nothing. Platform? Sister Cap. Did I miss someone? Melissa Rowe, my boss's daughter. She's a, she's a 19 year old that's waiting on a heart transplant. They think it's because it has a double lung in it. Mm. They just found out that her and her mama and her daddy all have COVID. So they yes. need a lot of prayer. Yes. Brother Richard. Hallelujah. 
That's hallelujah. That is good. Yes. Definitely. Definitely. Anybody else? Sister Judy. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And uh, Sister Amanda messaged me before service saying, uh, Sister Terry, she has an ultrasound coming up on Tuesday and she needs prayer. We need to remember her. She's having some pains. And uh, let's remember Pastor and uh, Sister Amanda as they travel and that the hand of the Lord is upon them and that they will be used mightily. Um, and I, I got one thing that I'd like to say that we need to remember that keeps coming up in prayer consistently the last few weeks for me is um, when I make my way to New Madrid, I pass coming out of Sykeston. There's new businesses coming. They're getting ready to build new houses. Um, let's pray that the Lord would draw people that have a conviction, that want to be closer to the Lord, that will draw people ultimately to the river bend, to the truth, to the truth, because that's what it's about. It's about the kingdom. But let's go to the Lord tonight in prayer. Um, he is doing good things, good things. Lord, we love you. There is no, nobody like you, Lord. There's none beside you. There is no equal. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But I come to you in faith tonight knowing that there is nothing too hard for you and that you do exceedingly, abundantly above all we can ask or think. Lord, I pray that we can get connected and get in tune in the above, that our thoughts go to the above, that our praise go to the above tonight, Lord. And I speak healing tonight, Lord, over every heart that may be failing, over all the blood issues, Lord, whatever it is. I pray for healing and sickness and diseases and the pains, Lord. I pray that uh, the pains of the joints would be eased. Lord, if there's any chemical imbalances in the, in the minds of the people tonight, Lord, I pray that that is healed and turned around and the minds are the renewed. They are renewed tonight, Lord. And I pray over our prodigals and our lost family. Lord, I pray that they do not lose their convictions, but they are drawn to you. Lord, I pray that you keep working on them and their homes and their children. Lord, I pray that your voice, that they hear it. Lord, whenever, whatever they may be doing, I pray that they hear your voice above all else. And Lord, I pray that your hand is upon our pastor as they travel and that you protect them. We are so grateful for their leadership and their covering, Lord. I pray that your hand is upon Brother David tonight as he preaches and that his word would come forth on good ground. In Jesus' name.
to praise him. I choose to praise the Lord Most High. There is power in choosing to lift up the name of Jesus. Miracles happen when we lift up the name of Jesus. Opportunities happen. Doors are open when we choose to praise him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to uh, go to offering if we can get the ways to give on the board tonight. Not work. Computers not. Work. There we go. Hallelujah. We have Givelify, PayPal available at RiverbendPentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri 63869. And we have the wood or the wood pans for offering and the gold pans for tithing. And you can also text to give at 833. 833- 883-9311. This is an exciting time. We serve a good God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. Our God is a giver. I want to be a giver. I want to give to the kingdom. I want to be closer to the Lord. Amen. I believe good things are going to happen through this prayer tonight. If you believe it, why don't you say it with faith? Upon the authority of your word, I have given and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out and all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name, amen.
Hallelujah. Aren't you grateful? There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There is nothing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated tonight. Once again, I just want to say I'm grateful for the body. I'm grateful for all the different ministries in the church and everybody that helps the body go forward, helps the church go forward. Um, but if we could get Children's Church to come forward. And River Bend ignited following them as they get up here. And we're going to pray for them tonight. We're going to continue to pray for them. We're going to pray that they get a hunger and a desire to seek the Lord with all their heart. And that there will be a focus in their lessons tonight and that they'll take something from it that they'll never forget. Because there are certain things that you learn in Sunday school that you just never forget. That keep you. That keep you here. And I believe it. I believe it. So... If you have faith tonight, I just ask you to reach your hand forward and pray with me tonight over these children and over the youth. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that from an early age that you work in their lives, that you put a pull, that you pull on them. And Lord, as they go back tonight, I pray that there will be a hunger for your word developed. Lord, that there would be a desire to have a prayer life, a desire to have a relationship with you developed in these children and in the youth. And Lord, I pray that you open doors for them, open opportunities for them to witness, to be used now. Lord, I pray that they don't feel the need to wait till they are older, but I pray that they feel now to do something. And I declare that in the power and in the authority of the only saving name of Jesus. And I pray that there be a covering of their minds, Lord, with the blood and the shield of faith that protects them from the pressure of this world to be somebody like the world. But I pray that they know who they are in you, Jesus. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Sister Chrislyn, if you would like to lead them back, we're going to bring Brother David up here tonight to, to teach us and the minors, minors, getting tongue, minister to us tonight. Man. But as I was thinking about that, I, I began to think on um, what Brother David preached last time. He preached on Christian warfare and, and the armor of God. And every time he preaches, um, I take something from it. And that is something that I pray every single day is putting on the armor of God. And I'm so grateful for Brother David. I'm grateful for his walk with the Lord. I'm grateful for his faithfulness and his knowledge. And I know he has something from, from the Lord tonight. Brother David, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Brother Blake. Praise the Lord, everybody. Well, we've got a good-looking crowd here tonight, so thank you for everybody here. Mr. Pastor, I've been enjoying these lessons that he's been teaching Brother Terrence. I've got something maybe just a little different tonight that I feel like the Lord's given to me, led me in this direction, and going to speak to someone's heart, I believe. I think there's times when we all go through what I'm going to speak about tonight. Uh, Psalm 63, verses 1 through 3, and you, you look at the book of Psalms, and Sister Marie, you've got to remember that it is a song. Most of those that are written, they're songs. They're, they're a form of worship, if you will. So whether it was written by David or Asaph or whoever might have written it, it's a praise. It's worship that is coming from them. It's a song that comes forth from them. It may sound like they're in, in situations that they don't know they're in, but it's a song that they're singing unto the Lord. It's worship. It's Psalm 63, 1 through 3. And it's probably written while David was fleeing from Absalom. It was written in the wilderness of Judea, if you will. And it says... O oh God, thou art my God, and early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Now you have to stop and think what David's saying here. David did not leave off singing because he was in the wilderness or because he was in the desert. He was in a place where he was fleeing from his life, Brother Derek, but yet he had a song in his heart. He had a praise in his heart. He had worship in his heart. He said to see thy power and thy glory so as I've seen thee in the sanctuary because of thy love and kindness is better than life and my lips shall praise thee. 
Psalms 42, 1 through 3. Possibly fleeing for, from Saul or Absalom again. David pins these words. And he said, As the heart panteth after the water brutes, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for thee, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night. And while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? His enemies were taunting him. His enemies were saying, Where is your God? Why, why are you in the situation that you're in? Where's your God at right now? Come on, David. What's, what's going on in your life? What's brought you to this place? I mean, I want to know where your God is. They're taunting him. They're making fun of him. And Ecclesiastes 3 and 1 says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Guess what? Time stops for no one. Time is constant. Seasons change. Seasons go. I think we only have two. We have summer and winter, and that's about all we have, it seems like. And right now, summer's big time. And I, I thank the Lord that I don't have to work out in this stuff anymore. We had, a, we had an AC unit, but Johnny, that was messed up at the store, and it was pretty warm in there. But it wasn't like being 110 outside like you probably have been the last few days. And I thank the Lord for that, but seasons come and seasons go, Brother Ronnie. They change. There's a, a time and place. There's a purpose for everything that we go through. In my message tonight, I want to talk about a season in the desert. A season in the desert. It's a time or period in our walk with God where we go through a dry time. We go through a lonely time where a friend can't be found. Where encouraging word can't be heard. It's times when it seems nobody understands our situation. Well, Shannon, you ever been there? I've been there. No one even seems to care. That's, that's what we're thinking. We're frustrated. We've been down and kneel down to pray, and we get up more frustrated than when we did when we began because we feel like God is not hearing our prayers. Yeah. It's disheartening. It seems God's not listening to us. We struggle to find answers as to why we have arrived at this place or this time in our walk with God. Why does it seem God has brought me to a desert place. Why does it seem like God has brought me to a dry place? What does he expect me to learn here? What does he want me to learn here? Now this is not a message of not hope. This is not a message of hopelessness. But it speaks of a learning experience. It speaks of a time that we got to go through something, Brother Cody. It's a time of restoration. But we got to be patient with God. we got to be patient with God. One writer said... It is what is called the desert of our soul. And even now, some of you may have found yourself there. I've been there several times. Went through things like that. Didn't understand why. But later I learned that God was trying to teach me a lesson. God was trying to show something to me. God was trying to reveal something to me. It's either bitter or it's cold. It feels like the heat is turned on full blast. Our lives seem fruitless. Everything we've worked so hard for seems like it's withering on the vine. And no rain has fallen. It's a desolate place, Sister Maria. It's a place that we don't understand why we got there. I found in studying for this lesson that the Antarctic, 5.5 million square miles, is the largest desert in the world. A desert is not measured by heat, but by precipitation. How much rain or snow falls in the year, any place that receives Ten inches or less is considered a desert. And the Antarctic only receives about two inches a year. So a desert place can be a very hot place or it can be a very cold place. I thought that was an inter interesting fact when we looked at that. We always think of a desert region as being hot, humid, arid. But it also can be a cold place. And we find ourselves there at times in our walk with God. We find ourselves in that cold place, if you will. The Bible tells us that God spoke to and even led people in and out of the desert. He spoke to Moses on the backside of the desert while he was tending to his father-in-law's sheep. He spoke to him out of a burning bush. He wanted to get his attention. He wanted to say, hey, Moses, you're here for a reason. You can look at Moses' life and his 40 years in the palace. His 40 years on the backside of the desert. And then his 40 years leading the children of Israel out. 120 years that he lived, but it was 40 years intervals. But he finds himself... In this place, and God speaks to him 
about going and getting his people out of bondage. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Jacob, Elijah. David found himself in the desert on numerous occasions. And Jesus was in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4 when the Satan came and tempted him after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Trying to keep him, keep him at a, 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 catch him at a weak spot, at a low point in his life. But it was in the desert region. A wilderness can also a wilderness can also mean desert. I looked at that word desert, and it kind of comes from two words. It comes from midbar or media bar, and it can mean wilderness, brother Shannon. But it can also mean to speak. It can also mean to speak. It also also can mean mouth. So there's some speaking going on while I'm here at this desert place. What is it we can learn from going through a desert season? Maybe it's a time when my heart has grown cold. Uh, I, I'm, I've sinned or sins me in my life. I'm angry with God because of something that He allowed or didn't allow in my life. We reach the place where we say, I just don't care anymore. Brother Justin, I don't have anything left to give. Believe me, I've been there. I went through times like this, Sister Leanne. Maybe when this happens, we need to ask ourselves these questions. How did I get here? What am I supposed to do in this desert season of my life? And what am I going to do to get out? I've always said and I've always told you that anything that I bring to you, I feel like the Lord has given to me first. I feel like the Lord has spoken to me first. But there's a reason that God has brought you to this place in your life. There is always a purpose in His plan. There is a lesson that he wants us to learn. It may be hard for us to hear, but he does not want us to get in a hurry. That's the, that's the hardest prayer to pray is, God, keep me here until I learn the lesson that you want to show me. We want to hurry up and get out of these situations, but sometimes, Sister Maria, it takes time for God to show us and to reveal to us what he's trying to teach us. It's hard. Why does God take so long? One is I don't want to find myself in this situation again. I want to learn the lesson the first time so I don't have to repeat it and go back through it again. You think, how, how easy would life be if we could do that? How many of you found yourself making the same mistake over and over and over again? I have. I've been there. It, yes. It, it's, it's easy to do. But if I can learn my lesson from what God is trying to teach me or what God is trying to show me, then maybe I won't find myself in that place anymore. Sometimes it might be a place of correction. It's a learning period, but it also might be a place of correction, a time that God is trying to correct me in my walk with Him. Psalms 119 and, 71, it's 119 and 71 said, It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Lord, I'm going to have to go through some things, but I'm going to learn your laws. I'm going to learn what you're trying to show me. Blessed is the man whom thou hast chastened, O Lord, and teach him out of thy law. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his corrections, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. The first question is, how did I get here? Maybe it's my own mistake or sin in my life, or maybe God has led me here. I begin to think about this, I begin to think of different, different things, and Elijah stands out so much to me in the things that Elijah went through, Brother Shannon. From 1 Kings chapter 17 to 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah went through some things. He had to endure some things. And we, we, we see him here in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. He's upset. He's just won this great victory at Mount Carmel when the Lord has defeated all these prophets of Baal. A great victory. And yet he goes out in the desert. You find out a little bit later in the verse, he goes out in the desert. He sits down. He said, I just want to die. I, I just want to die. He's won a great victory. God's been with him, and he's brought him to this place now, Brother Terrence. And he said, I just want to die. It's of his own making because he's running from Jezebel. Jezebel told him after the encounter at Mount Carmel, she said, I'm going to kill you. And he ought to know that she didn't have the power to do that. Yeah. But yet he took off running. He took off hiding, Sister Rita. 
and he finds himself out in the desert. And this, lead, this leads to his cave experience, if you remember. There's a strong wind that comes by, and there's an earthquake that comes by, and then there's fire that comes by, and God's not in any of it. Then God speaks to him in a still, small voice. He said, I'm the only one left. Here I am sitting out here by myself. I just wish I'd die. I'm the only one left, Lord. Lord said, let me tell you something, boy. I've got 7,000 prophets of Israel that have not bowed their knee to Baal. You're not by yourself. You're not by yourself. That's something that we need to remember. We're never by ourselves. Some of, the, some of the hardest times is for us to ask for help. For us to seek out for help. Brother Gio preached a little bit about that Sunday morning, about going to somebody. We need a companionship. We need a friend, someone that we can depend on, someone that we can trust to tell our problems to. We're not by ourselves. We're never alone. If we got God, we're never alone. But I know there's enough people in this church, they'd be ready to pray for you. They'd be ready to encourage you. They'd be ready to stand up and fight just along beside you with everything that you're going through. We need to remember that. We need to remember that. He's running from Jezebel. The desert may be, ways, may be God's way of getting our attention. It's where we are at our end of our own strength and we have to learn or to lean on Him and trust Him. One writer said it's in the desert where we are purged and cleansed of ungodly characteristics and habits which prevent us from becoming what God wants. I'm there for a reason. He's got a purpose in my life. Brother Cody, he's got a plan in, in my life. I need, to be able to, I need to be able to see that. The prophet Hosea. That's a strange story when you read the story of Hosea. God told him, he said, I want you to go out and I want you to marry this lady named Gomer. And she's going to be unfaithful to you. She's not, she's not going to be true to you. She's going to be unfaithful to you. It was, a, it, it was a, a time and a place where Israel was doing the same thing. He was trying to teach him a lesson. But I want you to go and I want you to marry this woman that's going to be unfaithful to you. It's going to cause you a lot of heartaches. Just as the nation of Israel had been unfaithful to God. And in Hosea chapter 2 verses 14 and 15, God says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her. And that word allure means persuade or seduce. And bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I'll give her vineyards from thence. And the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth. And as in the days when she came out of Egypt. The Lord says, I'm going to lead Israel into the desert. Into a dry, weary land. And I'm going to give her back her vineyards in the desert. In the valley of Achor. That doesn't make sense to us. To think about vineyards in places of, of, of great growth and, and beautiful, beautiful things growing in the middle of the desert. But that's what he said. I'm going to give you your vineyards in the valley of Achor. And she will sing to me and I will respond to her. I, I will respond to her. The land's going to flourish. The valley of Achor means the valley of trouble. It's a place of trouble. It's a desolate place. It's a wilderness place. When we first hear of Achor and Joshua 7, the children of Israel have won a great battle at Jericho. And they go on to the next little town, and they don't even send all their men to fight. It's a little town of Ai. It's just a small town. And he sends the warriors in. Joshua does. Brother Shannon, they come back defeated. Several of them have been killed. Several of them have been defeated. Joshua falls down on his face, and he asks the Lord, he said, What's going on? What's happening? You know, we just had this great, great victory at Jericho, and here Ai is not even near as big, and yet we've been defeated. He said, get up. There's sin in the camp. There's some things going on that shouldn't be there. Achan had taken some possessions that he shouldn't have taken, and he had buried them underneath his tent, and God brought judgment. And it was there in the valley of Achor that Achan and all his family and all his animals were stoned to death horrible place if you want to think about it at this and God says I'm going to bring you to the valley of Achor and I'm going to restore you there in the desert I'm going to give you back your vineyards I'm going to turn your valley of trouble into a door of hope a door is a passageway from one place to another I walk through that door I'm going from the auditorium into brother GL's office it's a, it's a door it's a passageway from one place to another where God wants to bring us into something new. 
And before he can bring us into something new, he's got to take us out of something old. Out of the place that we're in to get to that new place. He's got to bring us out of that old place, out of that difficult time into a place of restoration and a place of healing, a place of fruitfulness. And we need to understand that the Lord is not waiting. The Lord's not waiting for me to get up to the other side. The Lord's going to meet me in the middle. The Lord's going to meet me in the middle of that desert. He's going to meet me in the middle of that valley. He's not waiting for me to get out to the other side. He's going to come and He's going to meet me there. He's looking for me. He's waiting for me to make my way. But I've got to be the one that presses. I've got to be the one that goes. I've got to be the one that gets there. Israel wandered 40 years in the wilderness to get to the promised land. Can you imagine their relief and joy when they finally reached their destination? When their days in the wilderness were over, what does the promised land represent? The promised land represents the place God brings you to, your destiny, the goal of your calling, the place of your joy, blessing, completion, where His promises are filled. A shadow of heaven, if you will, Sister Maria. What does the wilderness represent? The place you go through to get to the place God is calling you to. The place of the journey to the place where God's promises are fulfilled. So the wilderness and the promised land are two very different places. A land of hardship and a, less, a land of rest and blessings. But there's something that we need to see. The wilderness is also part of the promised land. The wilderness is also part of of the promised land. And in, in, in looking at this, the promised land was part of the wilderness of Judea. Brother Terrence, so the wilderness that we go through, that we have to travel through, where we learn our lessons, is also part of the promised land. It's that passageway from one to the next, if you will. In our lives, we will have wilderness times of hardship. We're going to have losses. We're going to have challenges. We're going to shed some tears as well as times of waiting. Or simply not being in the place that you want to be. I'm not where I want to be. But remember the wilderness is not outside the purpose of God. The wilderness is not outside the purpose of God. It's a purpose that you have to go through the wilderness. For him to bring you into the promised land. To get to where God can use you. To accomplish his purpose. To fulfill the calling and the promise to you. In God's wilderness becomes the blessing. And He is always, He is always with us. What am I supposed to do in this desert season of my life? Seek after God and know that He will meet us there. I taught a lesson a while back and it was entitled, The Place Called There. And God told Elijah, He said, I want you to go to a place by the brook Cherith, and I want you to stay there. And while you're there, the ravens are going to feed you. The birds are going to bring you bread. They're going to bring you flesh. You're going to drink water from the, from the waters right there, from the rivers right there. It was a place that he was dealing with Elijah. It was a place that God told him to go. It was going to be there. He said, I'm going to meet you there, and I'm going to take care of you there. Well, guess what? Elijah had to go there. The provisions would not have been at any other place except for the place that God told him to go. He wouldn't have been fed and he wouldn't have had bread and he wouldn't have flesh if he hadn't gone to the brook Cherith. Brother Shannon, after a period of time, the brook dries up. God speaks to him again and he said, I want you to go to Zarephath. There's a little widow woman there. Her son there. And I want you to go there. He comes into Zarephath and he sees, he sees the lady. He tells her, he said, I want you to get me a drink. Bake me a cake. And she said, I'm gathering up the last meal that I have for me and my son. Then we're going to die. And he told her, he said, bake me a cake first. Seemed kind of selfish on his part. I'm thinking about myself. But guess what? The lady did it. The meal never run out of the barrel. And the oil of cruise never ran dry because she obeyed what God had told her to do. But God had brought Elijah there for a purpose. He had brought her there for a plan and to understand this just a little bit better. Elijah was actually running 
from Jezebel again. He was scared of her. And when you start studying about Zerapath, Zerapath was the birthplace of Jezebel. Wow. Right there where she was born, right there where she was raised, God said, I want you to go to the place where she was born and raised at. I'm going to take care of you there, Elijah. I'm going to take care of you in a place where she was born and raised at. Zerapath means melting pot. It's a hot place. It's a, it's a furnace, if you will. So it was a trying time. For Elijah while he was there. But God was wanting him to learn. God was telling him, I need you to go there so that I can deal with you, so that I can take care of you, so that you can learn these lessons along the way. So he had to go there for a purpose. Yes, ma'am. And another thing, the lady's son dies. While he's there, the lady's son passes away. It's her only child. And God uses Elijah to bring her back, bring him back to life. So a miracle took place. But he had to learn a lesson while he was there, while he was at Zarephath, while he was at a, a place of testing by God. David expresses his feelings in Psalms 42 of a deep longing, being thirsty or bitterness or sadness, he shed a lot of tears. He felt like he was forgotten and dying. And he closed out this passage by saying, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why are there disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. David chose to praise God even when he was going through a dry place. Even though he was in a place of a desert place, he chose to trust God. Prayer and fasting while we're in the desert season to the most powerful weapons that we have. And won't go into great detail. God led several men and women throughout the Bible to fast. Fasting is simply an outward expression of our inner submission. Telling God I'm completely dependent upon Him. It invites God into our situation so He will lead and guide us. When we fast, strongholds that have taken over our lives can be destroyed. I never really, I never really thought about it like that, Brother Shannon. But I invite God into my situation. I open the door and give Him access to my problems. I don't keep it shut up. I say, Lord, I, I, I need Your help. I can't, I can't do this. I can't do this on my own. I need Your help. Second Corinthians ten three through five says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing the captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. A stronghold is a mind impregnated with hopelessness. My mind tells me there's no hope. There's no way out. That causes the believer to accept an unchangeable situation that he or she knows is contrary to God's word. When I accept that, when I say it's unchangeable, when I say there's no way out, it's saying, God, you can't do this. God, you can't do this. I have to choose to allow God to take control. I found this prayer, and I thought it was very powerful. It's, it says, I refuse to allow the devil to build places of fortification against the plan and the will of God in my life. In Jesus' name, I will pull down the strongholds of darkness, influencing my mind, body, and spirit. Lord, do not allow my mind to be filled with such hopelessness that I would accept an unchangeable situation that I know is against your plans. Allow me to pray that, Lord. 2 Corinthians 2 and 11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Real trouble, arise, real trouble that arises in our life gives us a true measure of the spiritual state that we are in by how we deal with it, by how we allow God to help us. Proverbs 24 and 10 says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. 
Isaiah 40, 28 through 31 says, Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not? Neither is weary, and there is no searching of his understanding. He give power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mine up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. An eagle is a marvelous bird, but there are times that an eagle goes through a place in their life where their feathers have begun to molt and their talons have grown long and they can't so easily swoop in on their enemy because of their prey because they can hear them coming. And so what they do is they find a cave and they will go into this cave and they begin a molting process, if you will. Brother Bucky, they begin to molt those feathers off and they begin to take their talons and break them on the rock and they begin to sharpen them back again. And when they emerge out of that cave, they're like a new bird. They're like a new bird. They're able to soar like they were again. They were able to fly like they were again. The eagle never soars or never flies through a storm. The eagle will never fly through a storm, Brother Ronnie. It sets its wings and it soars above the storm. It never flies through the storm. So when we mount up with wings like eagles, Brother Terrence, we can fly over anything that the enemy throws at us. We can fly over anything that the devil throws at us, that the devil puts in our path. We're able to overcome them if we allow that to happen. I, I want to leave this with you in closing. This is Brother Jeff Harpo. He wrote a blog. He's got New Life Fellowship Church. He's got Terry Holt, Indiana. He's got a, a big booming church. He's got a lot of things going on, and he wrote a blog. But he wrote in the blog that he said the seasons is upon us but not the season we're thinking about. There's a season of well-doing which does not produce a crop. The Bible presents the need for us to continue in times of want. It implores us to work, pray, fast, give, and serve when there is no evidence of a harvest. The season of planting and waiting are always more critical than the harvest of reaping. The heart of the faithful is challenged when the right things are done, but the results is not evident. Everyone desires their due season, but few want to discuss the one which precedes it. The hard times, the difficult times. Seasons change, but I wonder if they are contingent upon how I treat them. It could be that the goodness of God is keeping me in my season so I can learn to rejoice in it. Trust is rarely found in a harvest, and growth is not always an upward movement. The process of growth entails pruning or cutting back. And one of the things that I one of the things that I left out when God called Elijah to Cherith, Cherith means cutting away or cutting off. There's some times in our life that we find out that there's some things that we gotta get rid of. There's some things that we gotta shed. There's some things that we gotta let go, that we gotta cut away out of our life because it's a hindrance. It's stopping me in my walk with God. It's stopping me in getting to the place that God wants me to be. So the process of growth entails pruning or cutting back. Paul and Silas were singing at midnight. They had been beaten, stripes on their back, thrown into the inner chamber because they preached the word of God. And at midnight, these boys are singing. These boys black are bloody. Most of us would have been having a pity party. But, hey, they're in there and they're singing and they're having a good time. They're singing at the top of their voice. I'm sure all the other prisoners heard them. And God sent a great earthquake and set them free. They did not allow their situation to determine their praise. They didn't allow the situation that they were in to determine what they were going through or where they were going to get out. God set them free. Everybody safe. Baptized the jailer and his, did his household. God set them free. They were showing us what it means not to faint in well-doing. I'm doing good. I'm preaching the word. I'm doing good. I'm doing what God wants me to. 
here they're going to throw me in prison, but that's not going to stop me from singing. That's not going to stop me from singing of the goodness of God. The season must not limit our faith or our work. There's some good seasons and there's some bad seasons. But it must not limit our faith or our work. If we continue, a new season will come. A new time will come. A time that we're going to flourish. A time that's going to be better than a time we fought. But we got to learn how to go through that desert season. we got to go learn how to go through that time when it seems unfruitful. But God's speaking to us. God's talking to us. God's dealing with us in our life. That's when real growth takes place. That's when real growth takes place. Stand with me tonight. I hope, I hope I've said something that's encouraged someone or lifted someone up, lets you see that what you're going through right now and I felt God talk, speak to me on this lesson that somebody is going through something right now. They're going through a rough season. They're going through a difficult time. But I want you to know that it's a learning experience. God is helping you to grow. God is helping you to mature. God is helping you to become, Brother Larry, what he wants you to be. So that he can use you for his purpose. For his purpose. And you'll come out stronger than before. I can promise you that you will come out stronger than before. Do we got any announcements that anybody knows of? Let's just see here. Just remember junior camp, July the 11th through the 15th, ages 8 through 11. Not much here. We had sick your sister last week. Isn't God good? Yes. Yeah. Amen. I'm so glad. I'm so glad what he's doing. And we're better because you're here. Yes. We're better because you're here. I, I like that. I don't know who come up with that, but I like that. We're better because you're here. Brother Blake, dismiss us in prayer tonight, brother.